All right. So good morning. Um, the floor is sticky and the desk has changed, but uh, otherwise I think we're good to go. Um, there is one little thing I promised you to do and I didn't do it in the previous lecture. So um, let me uh, quickly go over it. And that's sort of the asymptotic behavior of the OPE coefficients in, um, in the conformal block decomposition. So we take a four point function again for identical operators. Um, it has this form, there's a prefactor, then a function of the cross ratio and this sum of so for all primary operators that are not the identity and um, uh, with the OPE coefficient squared and the conformal blocks. Um, and then I said the integral of some density of OPE coefficients behaves in a particular manner. The precise statement um, is from a paper from, from 2018. Uh, I really don't know what happened here, but um, sorry. Um, uh, so here you see, so we want to know what happens at large delta. Here you see a power law, right? Delta is large, delta phi is the external dimension. So delta phi is just an order one number. Um, so here we see a power law. This prefactor is not important, but in this row tilde, in the definition, um, <coughs> So again, it should be some sum of delta functions with the OP weighted by the OP coefficient. So you're expecting something like this based on what I said um, before, but actually um, <clears throat> we should refine it a bit. So this is K of spin J, again, not the identity. And then there's an extra factor um, which the authors of the paper called K inverse J for, for reasons that, um, that are not important. And this factor K, J, delta K inverse behaves like pi four to the delta K plus J minus one and delta to the one minus U over two. So all this is to say that um, here is your exponential. If you multiply the OPE coefficients with something that grows exponentially four to the delta, then this density behaves like a power law. So, I mean, I could have, of course, asymptotic, I could have just moved it to, uh, to the other side. And this is at um, <coughs> large delta K, but fixed J. So you see that this information that we got is actually, um, we have information for each spin separately. So in the previous lecture, I said it's for all spins, but um, the information is more refined. We know that this is, has to be the case for, for each spin separately. And this again comes from expanding sort of this around taking the limit where Z and Z bar go to one, where operator two goes to operator three. And then you see that this whole sum must, must reproduce the exchange of the identity operator, the identity conformal block uh, in the other channel. Of course, it must reproduce, eventually it must reproduce everything in the other channel, but to leading order, um, the asymptotic behavior is dominated. The leading order behavior as that goes to one is dominated by the identity in the other channel. And that's what you need to, um, re to get to this result. So um, <clears throat> that's the small correction to what I, correction slash refinement. Um, of what I wrote uh, in the previous lecture. So the plan for uh, the last lecture is, um, I want to talk first a little bit more about the numerical, more numerical bootstrap. And it'll be a bit of a qualitative discussion. I, won't, I didn't want to introduce many more um, new techniques because it's my last lecture and um, I just want to highlight some results. I also didn't want this to become a laundry list of, of results. So I'll just highlight a few important results of the numerical bootstrap to show you um, the power, its power, but also its limitations and sort of what, um, and, and, and challenges I'd say. So uh, things 
that I think we will do in the next few years with this numerical bootstrap game. And then in part two, um, I want to discuss uh, a little bit about anti de Sitter space as matrices and uh, dispersive functionals. So because my aim was, my self-imposed aim was that you would, I'm, I'm not sure I'll reach it, but the aim that I stated was that you would understand like seminars and, and uh, modern conformal bootstrap papers. Um, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm, I'm quite getting there, but a big part of um, the conformal bootstrap nowadays is, has to do with these um, dispersive functionals, connections to ADS and scattering amplitudes. So that's why um, I want to dedicate my last hour to that. So what about more numerical bootstrap? Well, um, roughly speaking, we've seen this, this game that we play. So the general setup that people play, the general game that people play in the literature is um, you start with maybe not one correlation function, but a set of correlation functions. So a finite number of four point functions. And let me just denote them like that. Something like that. Um, you impose d dimensional conformal invariance. You use reflection, you um, assume reflection positivity. And this is a big thing because um, the current numerical bootstrap methods, they really, well, as I explained them, they really only work rigorously if you have reflection positivity, because only then can we build these functionals and, and show that there is a contradiction. We cannot solve contradiction. If you don't have positivity of these coefficients, you can still try to say something, but if, if they're not positive, it's, uh, it's next to impossible to, to get rigorous results um, of the type that, that I showed you in the previous lecture. So this game so far seems to work only for reflection positive uh, conformal field theories, of which there are many, but there are also many counterexamples. And especially, I mean, coming from a high energy background, it's very natural to have reflection positive theories. Um, coming from a statistical mechanics or condensed matter background, it's not always obvious that your theory is reflection positive. And so there are many conformal field theories that are not reflection positive for which this method uh, to date doesn't, doesn't work. Um, doesn't seem to work yet. So that's why I put the exclamation mark and after that um, people assume maybe some, some symmetries. So typical examples are, of course, we saw a reflection symmetry, a Z2 symmetry, where for the, two for the three dimensional easing model, the sigma field was odd, the epsilon field was even, uh, it's just reflection of all the spins on the lattice. But of course you can also impose uh, other symmetries like an ON symmetry or an SUN symmetry. And if that's the case, then of course these operators, they can transform in some representations of ON or SUN so you can add some indices to all of them and say some, assume something about the representations. Um, you can go crazy like I did in, uh, as, a, as a postdoc. You can impose some supersymmetry and uh, say the supersymmetry of n equals four super young mills, which happens to be as its algebra p is u2 comma two slash four. I don't expect you to know, but why not, right? You can impose that this theory is uh, you can impose that the theory obeys this super conformal, has super conformal invariance and then try to do numerics for, for such theories. Yes. Sorry, maybe a dumb question. But uh, is the relationship between the intersection symmetry and the chance is something that's been It requires work and work has also been done on this. Um, so you have reflection positivity in the signature that I'm working on mostly, which is Euclidean signature, where you just have uh, all, all your directions are, are, are um, uh, <coughs> are space-like. And then of course you can weak rotate to Lorenzian signature where one of your, so you analytically continue your time coordinates to purely imaginary values where you'll find the Lorenzian slice. 
And um, you can ask then, well, if I assume reflection positivity on the space-like slice, then I do the analytic continuation, do I find the unitarity in, um, <coughs> in the Lorenzian theory? And uh, that requires some work. The answer for CFTs now is, 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 is better understood than we understood it before, and, and it, seems to be, it seems to be yes. Uh, that that it's um, uh, that you get uh, that reflection positivity implies implies the unitarity. Yeah, I mean some things are not so hard to see. So for example, for the representation theory, we said that correlation functions delta is bigger than this value for for spin zero. We had these unitarity bounds. They, you see that there's, a, there's something going wrong with the two-point function, like both in Lorenzian and Euclidean signatures. So calling this a unitarity bound or a consequence of reflection positivity, it's immediate. Uh, for the rest, you, you may have to work a little bit, uh, bit harder to understand exactly what, what, the, con what um, the relation, the connection between the two. I mean, do you think the Weidmann axioms follow from the osterwalder scheider axioms? That's the question, right? Well, uh, ask, uh, answering this type of question is not uh, a within my reach, but uh, I mean, uh, I would say if you, if you doubt that posi special positivity does not, uh, does not, is not equivalent to unitarity because of the signature, then you have a, I don't know, some intuition that something might go wrong. No, I want to. I don't have an intuition that I don't need to say that something <laughs> must go wrong. I here the viewpoint we can now take is that these are these are mathematically completely well defined objects, and um, therefore, right, you can go back to the Weidmann axioms and and all of that and see what uh, what those axioms are. The connection. Oops. And the connection? Mm. Interesting. So now, I think we're good. The connection between Oster, between the Osterwalder Schrader axioms, the Euclidean axioms, and the and the, the Weidmann axioms. I mean, all of that is is sort of old news, but it's all being formulated mostly for massive theories. Here we have massless theories, and furthermore, we don't have to import all this stuff from, uh, if we just want to look at these correlation functions or maybe at, at endpoint functions of local operators, we don't need to import all that stuff where you have a Fox space of single particle and multi-particle states, which we don't even have here in flat space. Instead, we have these objects. And as I keep saying, there's a well-defined mathematical structure underlying this. Um, this is something you can explain to mathematicians and, and right in principle they would understand it, not just for four-point functions, but for endpoint functions. There's an associative algebra structure. So the question is now one of mathematical proof, because we have good axioms. So now you can ask what what about the like do you have a story that will not just convince physicists but also mathematicians? And that's where I think um, there is still work to be done that's being done now, that has been done in the past years. Physically, of course, yes, we believe that, that the two are equivalent. So and you start from all of this, and then um, you um, turn the crank, and you have your big machine, which is numerical bootstrap, and you get constraints on OPE data from functions. So um, there was a program last fall at GGI. I was here and there were many others and there were a couple of talks where this was exactly what people did. And uh, this is sort of a typical numerical bootstrap talk starts with, starts with this, uh, this kind of setup. So there are some noteworthy results. As I said, I want, don't want to give a laundry list. There are good reviews, um, but let me highlight a few. One, are the, um, one set of results concerns the ON models, where you just take your 5 Ford Lagrangian B 
but then for an n component vector field, sorry, a scalar, a scalar field with n, n components. Um, this, of course, for n equals one, you just get easing. So we discussed that. Um, there's nothing more that I want to say about it. For n equals two, um, this is the xy model at criticality. Uh, the xy model on the lattice at criticality is the same as this theory at criticality. Um, <coughs> I mean, it's, it's hugely important, of course, it, it in particular describes the superfluid um, transition in, in the lambda line in, in helium-4. Um, it also describes a bunch of quantum critical points and, um, and has many, yeah, and maybe some, some magnets with some, some, some easy plane. Um, <coughs> so uh, there are lots of applications of this um, in, for the numerical bootstrap. Um, from uh, a three correlator system um, tells you that there is, um, let me give you one, one uh, operator dimension, which is the, the operator, roughly speaking, phi squared, or um, like the energy operator in easing, we called it epsilon before, it's called S in the literature. Its scaling dimension is, um, Lies, must lie in this interval, um, whereas if you can compare this, you can compare this, for example, with Monte Carlo, who give um, 2, 2, 1, 5. Give this as the answer, which uh, is in very nice agreement. I would like to stress, because I'm also trying to sell the conformal bootstrap here, that this is um, a rigorous window. Right, this error bar is not statistical or something. The, this is the allowed window for the scaling dimension in the, in the conformal field theory. Outside, there's the no, inside there's the maybe. Whereas in Monte Carlo, of course, this, this error bar is statistical. There is a pr small probability, not, not zero probability, that the actual value lies outside this, winter, in this interval. Um, and I already told you that um, this experiment was done on the space shuttle um, they found, um, they measured, of course, the scaling. Um, <coughs> they didn't mention exactly the scaling dimension, they mentioned the, the critical exponent, but the two are easily related and they found this, this value. So, um, oops. So the experiment is wrong, obviously, because these two agree. Uh, um, <coughs> what? I mean, we are not experimentalists. So, but there is a, a, an interesting discrepancy between, between experiment and, uh, and the, the two theoretical predictions. Of course, this is difficult. The experiment is probably, probably really hard because um, there are all these corrections to scaling that you have to take into account. It's a multi-parameter multi fit to a single curve that you have. Um, and this is not easy. So you can try to see if with our values uh, the bootstrap values, the bootstrap doesn't give you just this value, it gives you a bunch of other scaling, scaling dimensions. You can try to see if you can fit the same curve with, with bootstrap values. It seems to work, but I mean, again, we're not experimentalists, so um, <coughs> we're not, we not sure. But it might be that the error bar on the experimental value is a bit too, too low. That's what we, what we as, as the, in the bootstrap community keep telling each other. Um, but yeah, so um, if the people at the International Space Station have nothing better to do, then uh, please repeat the experiment. So uh, for n equals three, um, of course, most famously, this is, so this is the O3 model. So this, this describes the critical point of isotropic magnets in principle. So um, you would have, So if I, if I give you a, a lattice, um, description, it would be the critical point of this, of this system. So, uh, over nearest neighbors, maybe some magnetic fields in some direction. 
And so it's the critical point of this, of this system, at h equals zero and j tuned to its critical part. Now, one interesting thing is that in the real world, um, the magnets may not be completely isotropic. Um, you may not have an exact symmetry in three dimensions. So this is O, this would give you O3 symmetry. But instead, um, there might be some other terms in your Hamiltonian that come from, for example, lattice effect. In particular, if you're on a hypercubic or, or just a cubic lattice, um, you would expect a leading term that looks a bit like this. That looks like this, exactly, in fact. So this would break isotropic, the, the, SO3, the O3 rotation symmetry. Uh, it would break it to a, to a hypercubic symmetry. So it would be natural to, um, to include this in your Hamiltonian if your, lab, if your system is not perfectly isotropic. And so you can ask, well, if I have a magnet on like a three component magnet, say a classical, a classical spin, right? In three components that lives on some hypercubic lattice. And then I in include to, to measure lattice effect with some coupling constant G if I include uh, this thing to, uh, to mimic the, the effect of the lattice. So what happens at criticality? Well, at criticality, of course, the important thing is um, if these are really lattice effects, then this is not something we can tune. It's like non-zero probably, but maybe with a small coefficient. So what we really want to know is whether this thing is relevant or not at the critical point, because either it destroys the stability of the, of the fixed point, and we would go to another fixed point if it's relevant, or it's irrelevant and then it just goes to zero. So important question, is this relevant at the fixed point? And this is, of course, an ideal question for the conformal bootstrap, right? For the lattice, it might be hard because um, they, they have to go to, this, to the critical point and there they have to, to measure one particular dimension that's not even the leading dimension. Um, and it turns out that it's also very close to three, this, this guy. But the bootstrap can tell you exactly whether there exist solutions to crossing where this guy is irrelevant or not. That is the hope, right? But I told you before that there was, there was, for example, I said it's d mu phi to the fourth, and that this was generically irrelevant, and so it would destroy, it would, rotational invariance would, would come up, would emerge. But it's really relied on this operator being irrelevant. Um, now, there's a different operator, because this thing is, is kind of a, like a space-time index, although, uh, of course, in the model, we treat it as an internal index. And so there's a different type of operator that would destroy not the rotational invariance of the continuum theory, but it would destroy the O3 symmetry of the, of the continuum theory. And so we have to ask the question that I, that I didn't really ask here. Here, I just said the answer is this is irrelevant. We have to ask the same question now for this operator. So it's an operator that is, that is obviously not a singlet of Om, because if it would be a singlet of O3, it would not break the symmetry. So it turns out to be some four index operator. Um, <clears throat> it's an operator in the continuum limit in, in that model. It would be some phi i, j, k, l, some, some operator t, i, j, k, l, some four index operator. For index tensor of uh, O3. So is this relevant? Um, and uh, is this point unstable? So the answer has now been given, but it was only done um, maybe last two years ago now in, in 21. Um, it is in fact relevant. So O3, so, so there's an instability of the O3 fixed point. 
um, with respect to cubic deformations. If you manage to, to tune the cubic deformations to zero, uh, these, these deformations to zero, then, then it's fine. Uh, <coughs> this, uh, this cubic symmetry preserving deformation. Then of course you can still hit the O3 fixed point. But uh, in the real world, uh, there seems to be an instability. Uh, the dimension of this operator, there's an upper bound. I call it T4, is less than, is strictly less than 2.99056. That's the best upper bound nowadays, which is strictly less than three. So it's, it's relevant. Yes? So do you have such an element of the term in the XY model also? Or only in the I guess it's an enhancement of what typically is called the XY model, yeah. yeah. Oh, there, uh, in the XY model. Yeah, of course, there's already an anisotropy because it's sort of easy plane magnets, right? Um, if there's a further anisotropy in, within the easy plane, there might be such a guy. I'm not sure if it's relevant or not. Um, I, for, I, I don't know. It, there might be such a guy, so it's like a spin four operator, a, a charge four guy probably in the O2 model because O2 is U1, so my charges are just labeled by integers. And um, <clears throat> I think it's a charge four guy and the question of its relevance or not is probably was more easily settled than, than here. But I forgot whether it's relevant or not. It's, it's, it's a valid question. So here, um, it was obviously hard to settle because we believe that the bound doesn't get much better than this. It's not that we, we got something, no, the people who did this, it's not like they got an upper bound that was three and then below three and then they stopped. They really pushed very hard and this seems to be uh, as, as well as they could. So I guess they have the dimension of this operator to within two or three significant digits. It's strictly less than this, but it's not much less than this, which is also why the lattice found it difficult. You had a question. Yeah, I'm just curious, if we use a functional method, we can maybe say that there is some solution to the Poisson equation with some operator with which delta is like a better bound. Mm -hmm. How do we know that this operator would, would break the Poisson? Yeah, uh, well, this operator definitely breaks the O3 symmetry because the operators, become, they're labeled by their representation. Oh, no, no, no. Suppose if we find using our method that there's a solution to the crossing equation, then do we automatically know that this operator that is being bounded is the one that we actually want? Um, this is the upper bound on the first, so, so you get bounds as a function of the representation. So um, the bound is like, so here we had a, for easing, well, for the easing kink, we had delta sigma, delta epsilon, if we just did a single correlator, get something like this, right? Um, if you have ON models, then this would be phi i, and this would be, say, the singlet, but you would also get a bound on uh, the charge two operator or the two index symmetric operator tij as a function of delta phi and it would be whatever it is and then same for the four, for the four so you can just because it you get a more complicated conformal block decomposition from which you can disentangle the different representations so obviously i am going to what people look at is uh, tijkl there's delta phi there's an upper bound I mean, the upper bound may be strange, but there's also, from the multi-correlator system, you also have an island here. So you're only going to look at these values of delta phi. That's a small assumption that I should have stated. And for these values of delta phi, you look at your upper bound for the first operator, and it's, it's, less than, it's less than three. So there must be an operator in this interval. I, I mean, that... It's just the lowest dimension operator of the red quantum numbers. No. I think there was a student. Can, can. Uh, it's important to go the special dimension here. You consider three dimension or a formula that we consider the O3 model in the uh, other dimension? Um, I don't think so. It, it sits here, right? Because we do functionals and the conformal block depend on the space time dimension. 
because I gave you this conformal blocks in four and two dimensions is some combination of hypergeometrics and then in three dimensions it's hard. So obviously for different dimensions you get different bounds. So um, yeah, this result is definitely only for D equals three. Everything I said here is for 3D. Um, for 4D, of course the theories, so uh, <coughs> in D equals three, I should have added that. In 4D, all these models at criticality are trivial, they're free theories. You can still try to do this game and say, well, I'll just assume that there exists some theory with O3 symmetry, and I'll just assume there is some operator that is a vector, and there's some other operator that's a singlet, and then I'm gonna take the system of correlators, and I repeat the game, and I get some bounds. You will get some bounds for the space of all theories in four dimensions with O3 symmetry. But we believe that the criti these critical points, are, we know the beta functions are positive, and so at one loop already. So at long distances, they, they go to the free theory. So um, yeah, there might be other theories. There might be, say, supersymmetric theories that have that symmetry and that you're gonna that, uh, have to obey this bound. But uh, so far, it doesn't, like, for example, people didn't really find very sharp kinks, right? If you find a sharp kink nowadays, we think that's interesting, just from, for, for historical reasons, because kinks in the past are interesting. But so far, if you do that kind of game, people didn't find, find kinks or islands or anything too, too interesting, I think. But yeah. If you, if you do uh, lambda 5 plus in 4 minus x, no? with a cubic uh, thing, you will see that it will be relevant for 4 minus x, in, in 4 minus x. The, minus x. the cubic coupling? The cubic coupling is not irrelevant. It's, it's dimension 3. In, in, it's dimension. Okay, but okay. when you diagonalize the matrix for uh, to get the scaling fee, uh -huh. it's uh, irrelevant. It's just standard calculation. So this is uh, something not so simple. So as it goes down in dimension from 4 minus x to 3, it changes from. Uh, no, the cubic coupling is relevant in the epsilon expansion because it's already it's relevant. No, it cannot be. It's dimension 3. In 4D. Okay, but then you have it's to not go you have to diagonalize in the space of coupling to find the scaling fees, and you find that if the other thing is hanging back. Okay, it's okay. It's a standard calculation design uh, work. Ah, okay. If you extrapolate all the way to D equals 3, yes, of course. Yeah. No, that is the statement that you only have to tune. It's a Z to odd coupling yes. in the easing in N equals 1. And that is the statement that, of course, uh, phi cubed should become irrelevant because we only tune the magnetic field at criticality. We don't have to tune another Z2 odd coupling. So yes, I, I agree that you, you won't see it in the epsilon expansion, but if you extrapolate the extra epsilon expansion results, then it should become irrelevant. Uh, and because if I look at the magnet or the easing model at criticality, I only tune the magnetic field and I'm done in the Z2 odd sector. So if it wouldn't be, if it would remain relevant, then yeah, then, then uh, people doing lattice easing would have to tune at something else, but they're not, they don't. So it's clear that it's irrelevant. Yeah. You cannot, you have to be some epsilon expansion or extrapolate. But we made an assumption, right? In easing, I said in a previous lecture, we assume there's only one Z2 odd relevant operator. So we implicitly assumed that phi cubed was, was, relevant, was irrelevant. Sorry, phi cubed is a descendant, but I'm, okay. No, I'm discussing the, the fourth order, uh, phi fourth with, uh, with uh, cubic symmetry, so the breaking of cubic symmetry by fourth order phi. Oh, cubic, oh, I see. Uh, of, 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 the, uh, of the O3 symmetry. Oh, you mean this symmetry, this guy? Yes, yes. Oh, this guy is relevant. It's true that in, in, in the F instance, it's irrelevant. Okay, but then. Sorry, I, uh, we, we were talking about two completely different things. Yes. So that, that telegram that you formulate in the, in okay. the five fold, okay? So, you have the so five this, this operator, yes. you say it's irrelevant perturbatively. You, yes, for okay. n less than four. Okay, but it's not. It's it, not non-perturbatively. Okay, but non-perturbatively it must be relevant. That's what yes. we know now. Yeah. Okay. okay, all right, uh, thanks, okay, yes.
So perturbation theory does not give you the right answer here. Yes, you see, it's a, it's a very delicate balance. So uh, uh. I, I no, no longer have perturbation Okay, sorry. Yeah, I understand. Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, it depends, right? It, that is exactly the question. Like, if you break certain symmetries, like rotation symmetry, it emerges, right? You don't have to put it in. But a cubic symmetry, this, uh, this hypercubic symmetry, you have to put it in, otherwise you destabilizes. So it's not always the case that breaking the symmetry changes the fixed point. It depends on whether an operator is relevant or not. That's exactly it, right? If there's a relevant operator, then it's unstable if it's irrelevant. Then it's safe. This new operator is relevant, and you have to draw uh, phase diagram, and you look at the stability point and the Yeah, that's the game. Yeah, you have to you have to go and and do perturbation theory around the fixed point maybe, but around the fixed point you don't you only know it numerically, so it's hard. One thing you can try to do is, um, I mean, this is very weakly relevant, so it's a bit like the Wilson-Fisher fixed point in the epsilon expansion, right? So probably there's a one-loop beta function to this guy, which is positive, most likely, and so there's a new fixed point that's probably very close to the old fixed point because this is at, at very weak coupling. So there's likely, I, I'm not sure, but there's likely a cubic CFT with scaling dimensions that are very close to, to this one. No, because Monte Carlo people can tune this, right? Because it's an interaction between the lattice and the O3 index. Because, but if you do Monte Carlo, then uh, you you don't have to do have to have that interaction. You can impose that the that the, the microscopic theory is this, which is exactly O3 invariant. And as long as you have an O3 invariant model, it's fine. Are we good? Okay, this turned into the discussion that I was um, kind of expecting it to turn into. Um, so these bounds, uh, and then of course, so this was n equals three, and then n, n equals four. There's some results, but, but not so much. It gets progressively, I guess, a little bit less interesting. Um, so this was all done, if I do something like this, this was all done from a bootstrap of three operators, which is phi i, the singlets, and um, uh, so f like phi squared. Of course, we don't put in that it's the operator is phi squared. We put in that there is an operator that's a singlet under the on symmetry, and uh, phi i j, uh, phi i phi j, which is a two index symmetric traceless tensor of, of O n. So it's these, the, the, these three operators, and then you look at all the possible correlation functions of these operators that are allowed by ON symmetry, and then you get these type of results. So again, you can, you can throw in more operators. I've already said that for easing, you can put in the stress tensor here, it's the same thing. In principle, we know that the stress tensor exists, why not throw it into the mix? Well, the answer to that question is just because it's technically extremely complicated. So maybe in a couple of years. 
Um, let me skip some other results. Um, so, Results, so I have a dot there for ON models. There's also Gross, Neveu, Yukawa models, which are models with uh, N fermions plus one scalar. And uh, you can get, nowadays, this was hard because people had to do four point functional fermions, but the talk I was talking about in, that was happening in this room in October present the speaker there um, presented some very nice results where they also found these type of islands for uh, the ghost nouveau yukawa models. I, um, yeah, there, there, there are many other theories that have been analyzed. Mostly these are sort of the most famous of the island results. Many other theories have been analyzed, again, for example, you, you assume some symmetry, so you don't assume a theory, right? You assume some symmetry and then you hope that the theory that you're after comes out somehow. And so what people found is that for ON cross OM models, um, multiscalar versions of, 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 of this, of this uh, simple um, ON uh, Lagrangian, uh, people found mostly kinks, sometimes islands with some assumptions, um, or sometimes they found nothing. Uh, that's that's the game that, that people play. Yes. And are there any cases in which the others are truly Are there only continents? I think there are always continents. Yeah. Uh, so far. <coughs> so um, rather than what's the question? Oh, no. Okay. Um, so let me. Highlight one interesting. So the list of targets is also still huge. And uh, if you have your favorite critical points, you can ask me maybe afterwards what's, what I think about it. If it's not reflection positive, I don't have much to say. Um, one interesting target are the so-called conformal windows. In D equals three and four. So uh, the most important example there, the prototypical example is just generalized QCD. So you take SUN, uh, Young-Mills theory, in D equals four with um, NF Dirac fermions, massless Dirac. So you have two parameters. In the real world, we have SU3 for QCD with, well, how many flavors? Let's say two. I mean, there's six, but they're all very massive. Most of the quarks, uh, they're, the up and down are kind of massless. They're very light. So um, let's say approximately two. So that's where we are in the real world. But you can ask, well, what happens for, um, uh, for, uh, in this generalized, uh, as people sometimes call it, fairy QCD. Um, the beta function at one loop is your standard quantum field theory homework problem. If you have a lot of time for your homework. And it's this for the Young-Mills coupling. So we see that it's, if the number of flavors is too large, it's positive. And the theory flows with, the coupling flows with negative the beta function. So the theory at long distances is free. So we have this picture where, let me just plot NF and fix N. And it's a Monday plot, so it fits just here. So here, uh, the beta function is positive. So the theory is just free. You get just free um, quarks and gluons. So here is NF for fixed N, or NF over N if you want. Then at the low end, we believe there's, um, there's chiral symmetry breaking, which is what happens in um, 
in our world. So psi bar psi, you get a non-zero condensate of the fermion bilinear, which breaks the SUN flavor symmetry, SUNF flavor symmetry. And here you get Goldstone bosons. So the theory is a theory of massless fields, Goldstone bosons, but it's kind of trivial at long distances. It's not an interesting conformal field theory. It's still an interesting theory, but it's not an interesting conformal field theory. Um, so you get, and of course, in the real world, we, we, those are the more or less massless. So in this fairy world with massless quarks, you get massless pions. In the real world, the up and down have a small mass. So you get three uh, approximately massive uh, pions, um, <coughs> which are the pi plus, pi minus, and pi zero. And then in between, um, there is sometimes a so-called conformal window, where it is believed that the theory flows to a C of t with, uh, what can, so you can ask, well, what can we say about this C of t? It's non-trivial, it's not free theory. Um, it comes out of this complicated Young-Mills theory in the, in the, at short distances. And at long distances, well, we don't know much about it, uh, the one thing that's kind of obvious is that we have a flavor symmetry that rotates these fermions because all these fermions are identical. So you have a UNF flavor symmetry. So one way to try to bootstrap this, this conformal field theory is to assume that there's this UNF symmetry. And then maybe we can, and, and maybe we can say one or two other things about, about this theory. Of course, it, it's strongly coupled, so there's very little else we know. Maybe we know a little bit about the number of relevant operators. I haven't thought about it deeply. But um, this, is, this is obviously an interesting target for the bootstrap. In particular, there is this NF star. There's some critical value of NF that depends on N. And I think it would be very interesting. It's a long-standing open problem in, in high energy physics to and in quantum field theory in general to, to determine this NF star. It doesn't have to be an integer. Of course, we only really have theories for the integer values, but uh, you, can, you can try to determine this NF star as a function of n. Uh, I think it would be hugely interesting to, to, try, to try to bootstrap this, but it's, it's still difficult because the natural starting point would be a four-point function of currents with U and F symmetry, uh, and maybe the stress tensor and that's a hard, that's a hard system. How do you bootstrap that? How do you define bootstrap this potential? Yeah, the, how do I define even the theory if NF is not an integer? Yeah, exactly. So let me just stick to the integers, yeah. Let me stick to the integers. So then NF star of N is, is some not smooth function of N. Yeah. No. No. So the plot only works for the integers. Let me say that. Right. In this interval. Yes. Yes. There turns out to be an inter. So if you make n big enough, then we have control, and then there are a lot of integers in between. Uh, and so at some point, the uh, number of integers shrinks to to one or zero. Okay, yeah. It depends a bit. Is the beta function for G or is, yeah? Sure, you can you can call it G cubed. Yeah. I think it depends on on what you what you have your beta function for. No, is it the beta function for G or for G <laughs> squared or, or whatever? It depends a bit on convention. This is a more standard convention, I guess. Um, <coughs> Of course, there's no, the important thing here is also to note that there's no classical term, right? This coupling is classically marginal and only gets, uh, starts running at, at one boot order. So um, let me finish this first hour um, then by saying that uh, what's the outlook here? Um, I think what we're trying to do with our little community is we're trying to get better, better software um, so that we can attack these more complicated systems, but we also need better algorithms 
that I don't have time to talk about. But in some sense, it's kind of obvious that we really need to dive into this world of linear and semi-definite programming, which is something we're doing. We're talking to applied mathematicians. We're trying to see if our algorithms are efficient or if we can, can improve them. Uh, we made some proposals for, for better algorithms that, that can handle more complicated systems much faster now. Um, but it's obviously, we're sort of driven towards this, this little domain of research. And then of course, um, lastly, I think new applications. That is the target. There are always more conformal field theories to, to bootstrap, it seems. And so uh, there's always, always, always more to come. So that's where I wanted to end this hour. Any, any questions? Yeah? In D equals two, yes, absolutely, yeah. Um, there are Vera Zero conformal blocks. And so your blocks are much bigger. I wrote them with a big G a couple lectures ago. And then people say, well, the minimal models, it's solved, right? And the rational CFTs, it's solved. But what about this huge space of non-rational conformal field theories? We know very little about them. We have very little evidence that like, well, we have a very, very limited understanding of even methods of constructing conformal field theories in two dimensions with C greater than one and nothing but VR zero symmetry. If we want to build something, we always start from a symmetric setup and with the symmetric setup, we always get some extra um, Katsumudi symmetry or W symmetry or whatever. So what about CFTs with C greater than one in 2D with just VR zero symmetry? We know very little about them, and, and they're an obvious target for the bootstrap. Yeah. Uh, yeah, because you could decode everything about the, about the focal reflection to get some constraints on the CFTs. Mm -hmm. Can we go to obtain more constraints and better algorithms of the best using some function, for example, to further constrain the CFTs? Well, it, there are two answers. In theory, Definitely no, because it's an associativity condition, right? So I said you test A, O, O1, O2, O3 equals, so this is the fundamental condition we're testing. And by the operator state correspondence, this just, we have to project this onto all the other operators and we do that by sort of taking an inner product with O4. So this is everything. Um, in practice, I think there might be, so if you look at all the four point functions, you're done. In practice, five point functions are sometimes a useful way of packaging a bunch of information that you can principle also find from infinitely many four point functions. I don't think they're an attractive target for numerical methods, but for analytical methods like this large spin expansion, they can be very useful. All right, then let's take a break and I'll see you in uh, 10 minutes or so. All right, I think we can start again. Um, so for part two, I wanted to touch upon, which is always a scary thing to do, but I still wanted to touch upon some new topic. Uh, which is quantum field theory or quantum gravity in uh, ADS. And I think it's scary because I won't have time to explain to you everything. I'll try to give you a, bird's eye, a bit of an overview of what's happening in this field. Um, Just a question about your concept. So I think it's your last part. Yeah. So the best graphics line thing would be... It's, it's a little bit of this. Yes, yes, we're getting there but it's uh, very little. Um, you can ask me more in the, this, I'll be here for the discussion session. So if you have questions about the numerical bootstrap, then uh, you should also, um, we should also, we should also postpone it to there. So I'm going to look at, um, introduce D plus one dimensional curved hyperbolic space, also known as anti-decider space. So curved space, so I'll begin with the, uh, 
a bunch of coordinates, you have your x mu, which we had before, and then a, which I just in uh, Rd, and then uh, we have a z, which is uh, a z coordinate, which is non-negative. And um, so that's a coordinate system, and now I give you a metric, and then I have given for you everything you need to know from the differential geometry viewpoint. Um, so this is the metric. And you see the metric blows up near z equals zero, which is the boundary of this, of this uh, hyperbolic space. So um, we think of it, one way to think of it is some, some half space. But then you should really, um, this boundary here at z equals zero is really infinitely far away from any point with, with finite z. And this uh, R here is a parameter, the Ricci scalar. If you compute it using your GR um, knowledge, which I hopefully you still remember a little bit, the Ricci scalar um, is basically one over R squared. So R, we call it the radius of curvature of ADS. Um, and if R is very large, then ADS is nearly flat. And if R is very small, then ADS is very much curved. So now you can ask, well, what about the isometries of ADS, the, the ADS killing vectors? So remember in flat space, killing vectors are the isometries. They leave the metric completely invariant. So it's just translations and rotations. It's the Poincaré algebra. Here, what are the killing vectors? What kind of vector fields, if I do a diffeomorphism along them, leave the metric invariant? Well, clearly there are the translations and rotations of this, of this d-dimensional subspace, right? So we can immediately write down b mu, which is just d mu, the translations, and m mu nu. Those are definitely killing vectors. They leave the z-coordinate completely invariant. Then there's also rescaling. So there's a, there's a vector field x mu d mu plus z dz, which does a uh, small rescaling of all the coordinates. And you can kind of see what happens, right? I scale all the coordinates, then the x's, they pick up effect, let's say with a factor lambda. I get a factor lambda squared from all of this in the top, but I also get a factor lambda squared from the z squared in the denominator. And so this is a proper isometry of ADS. It's not, in flat space, this would not be, uh, it would be a conformal transformation. It would rescale the metric. But it's an, it leaves the ADS metric completely invariant. So let me call this D. And then there's also um, another vector field, which you'll have to believe me, or just do the computation yourself. Um, which turns out to be also an isometry of ADS. And I'm gonna call this K. So these are the isometries of ADS. And of course you recognize the names and you see perhaps already what they do. They're just like the conformal algebra. They're the conformal algebra in D dimensions, but now I'm in a space with one more dimension. I have one extra dimension attached. So in fact, we can make this precise. You just send Z to zero. If you send z to zero, well, these two doesn't change. This one becomes the dilatation. And this one, if I did not make any mistakes, which is unlikely, but suppose I did not make any mistakes, then this one becomes the special conformal transformation. <coughs> so we can say that um, these isometries become, as z goes to zero, um, they become boundary vector fields, which are the vector fields we've already seen, which are the conformal killing vector fields. <coughs> so what happens is that you kind of have conformal transformations um, acting on the boundary coordinates if you just <coughs> act with an isometry in ADS. But many things are invariant. If you just put now a quantum field theory in ADS, 
Many things are invariant under the isometries of the background. If I put it in flat space, many things are invariant under translations and rotations. Now I do the same in curved space. So many things are invariant under these isometries. So I take a correlation function and uh, of, of a bunch of points in ADS, I get something that's up to some prefactors that are automatically invariant under the isometries. But now I can push the insertion points of this correlation function. I can take an endpoint function in ADS. I claim it's, it's naturally invariant under the ADS isometries. And then I push it to the boundary. I send all the z to 0. And then by this trick, I automatically get something that happens to be a conformally invariant function of the boundary coordinate, up to some, some simple prefactors. But the prefactors I can take into account. So this is a way to um, generate conformally invariant functions from um, correlation functions of a quantum field theory in ADS. <coughs> so the claim that I want to make is that uh, the limit as zi goes to 0 of some, some endpoint function in ADS so what do these endpoints depend on? Well, it's like x1 mu z1 xn mu zn. So this limit up to some fact, some power of z as it turns out is, well, I'll let me define it to be some endpoint object And the claim is that this is conformally in covariant endpoint function. So it's not a CFT correlation function, but in all sort of essential respects, it behaves like one. <clears throat> so it's a nice trick to generate um, conformally covariant co endpoint functions at this stage. <clears throat> so as a simple example, let's consider the propagator uh, for a scalar field. So uh, if I, well, let me denote the insertion points as P1 and P2, because otherwise I would have to write x and z, uh, and or sometimes x, whether, depending on whether I'm looking in flat space or not. So I'll just denote it like this. And of course, uh, g of P1, P2 is um, basically maybe up to some factor. A solution of just a propagator for the, or a solution of this inhomogeneous massless Klein Gordon equation. So let me remind you that in flat space, um, G of P1, P2 is of course just hmm, the Klein Gordon propagator, right? So just to, to fix ideas, this is, the, this is the thing we're looking at. But now we want to know what it is in ADS space. So in ADS, well, what is it? It turns out that it is some nasty function. Yes? Uh, oh, yes, sorry. Thank you. Should be a mass here. Thanks. So in ADS, it turns out, right, because of these complicated isometries, it is some function, let me call it G tilde, which depends, because it's a homogeneous and isotropic space, it depends only on the distance, the ADS distance between P1 and P2. 
You can try to solve the equation. It's a second order differential equation um, because it's a function of only of the distance. It turns out to become a function on a single variable linear differential equation. It's fairly easy. You, you find that the answer is some, again, some two of one hypergeometric as it happens. Um, so this is some two of one hypergeometric, but what we are interested in is the limit as that goes to zero. Um, so this is complicated, but uh, the limit as z1 and z2 goes to zero of uh, this g tilde, again, up to some factor, is a conformally invariant function of two variables, two positions. So it's the only thing that it can be which is just x1 minus x2 to the power 2 delta. But um, as it happens, the only thing we need to determine now, well, this normalization is not that important. So um, the only thing that's important is to determine what delta hat is. So here, of course, I started with a massive scalar field uh, and the mass propagates all the way in here, and it turns out that there's a relation between the mass and the um, scaling dimension of this, of this two-point function that you get. So that's just one example of the claim, right? It's a complicated, I, I didn't write down all the functions, but, but you see that this is exactly what I, what I claim. Is it clear? Yeah? Uh, it's a power. This is not an upper. It's always a number. It turns out that the limit, so let's think a bit. The boundary is infinitely far away. If you measure the distance between a point and the boundary of ADS in this metric, it's a simple integral of ds, which is infinite. So the boundary is infinitely far away. So now I send these points to the boundary of ADS. Then by cluster decomposition, I expect the whole correlator to vanish which is in fact what, that, what happens. So to get something non-zero, what I have to do here in general is, um, doesn't have to be read, insert some divergent factors to offset it. And to offset, the right offset turns out to be minus delta one, uh, z one, z two to the uh, minus two delta. This turns out to be the right factor which was kind of natural because now it has sort of the same, the same dimension. What is the limit? Well, z1 goes to zero, z2 goes to zero. Are commutative and being noisy or do they have some problem with the zero? No, the limit is generally, uh, the limits are generally commutative. That's why I can write it like that. Unless you put the point operators at the same point, because then you get like a correlation function evaluated at the same point. And then you have to be very careful about contact points and so on. So if you're in interested in the distributional nature of the gadget that you get with identical points, then yes, you have to worry. But I'm not, and so I don't worry. So let's uh, build a bit on this example and consider a free theory in ADS. And um, let's do a four point function. So I have four points, one, two, three, four. They live somewhere in ADS. And I want to look at the four point function phi one to phi four. Well, what is this four-point function? It's a free theory. So if it's a free theory, there are no interactions, and the only thing I get is what I get in flat space. It's just recontractions. So for example, I contract one with two, I get a propagator. Three with four, I get a propagator. And then maybe the, uh, the other two contractions, so let me write plus the two obvious permutations. And I'll write that as plus perms. So um, <clears throat> the limit as z goes to zero of uh, 
up to some factors, z to some power of the same thing, is then what? Well, we already saw what the g becomes. So this is just 1 over x12 to the 2 delta, x34 to the 2 delta, plus the two permutations. Which I can also write, we've seen this before, I think it turns out that there's a 1, and then in terms of cross ratios, you can rewrite this as z, z bar to the delta. Oh, these are delta hats, of course. Z, z bar, 1 minus z, 1 minus z bar. So this is, uh, this is the solution. This is the four-point function that you, you get. And you can decompose this into conformal blocks because it's just like a four-point function. Uh, I'm going to erase this board even though it's my, uh, the one I wrote last, but I don't think I wrote, I wrote too much. Z is not that Z, yeah, sorry, yeah, right, so the Z is, uh, it's the Z of the cross ratio, right? So remember that U is uh, Z, Z bar, and V is one minus Z, one minus Z bar, in terms of my, the new Z bar that I introduced in this equation. So if you don't want to confuse yourself, you, you replace this with a U, and this with a U, and this with a V, so now we're good, and then I erase this, and now everything makes, makes sense mathematically. Yeah, thanks. Where u is x12 squared, x34 squared over x13 squared, x24 squared, and v is the, the other combination. And so I want to say that this is 1 over x12 to the 2 delta hat, x34 to the 2 delta hat, 1 plus sum over k, well, it turns out I know exactly the conformal block decomposition of this. This was a little work that was done more than 10 years ago. And these coefficients are known. And the scaling dimensions that turn out to be 2 delta hat plus 2n plus l for spin l. Uh, OK, I'll write it as uv. These are the conformal blocks. So and these are known. There's some complicated fun combination of gamma functions and stuff. <coughs> okay. So this solution, well, solution, what, what do I want to, why do I call it this? It's a solution to the crossing symmetry equation. It's a crossing symmetric object. There's a good conformal block decomposition in every channel. Um, so in some sense, it's a good solution to the crossing equations. Instead of solution, I can also say this four-point function or, well, something that I denote by double brackets, right? It's some, some conformally invariant four-point function that may not correspond to an actual CFD. So this thing is important. It's called the generalized free solution. And of course, you can play the same game for endpoint functions. You can build a whole set of correlation functions. You just take these combinations of propagators, you send them to the boundary, and then it's like you're doing V-contractions on the boundary theory, but for every contraction, you don't get the, the, the propagator that I erased, but you just get 1 over x i j to the 2 delta. There's some applications of this thing also in statistical mechanics. For example, um, it it's describes the 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 trivial limit of the long-range models, of long-range easing models. For certain parameters, it, it, it flows to, to generalized free theory of long distances. But one thing that we um, are interested in is, of course, not free theories, but interacting theories. And so the reason I... Um, I introduce this, this function is that if you have, this is sort of your starting point. If you have a theory in ADS that's interacting, 
if you can describe it perturbatively, then to tree the tree level result is just generalized free, or at least if you send all the positions to the boundary, you're going to find generalized free. And then the interactions are corrections to generalized free field theories. So interactions in ADS are like corrections to GFF. Now what can these interactions be? They can be like interaction, if you have to put lambda phi fourth in ADS, then you're going to get some, some diagrams in ADS that you can compute and you will get some small correction to the GFF group. So you will see that as some small corrections to the scaling dimensions and some small corrections to the coefficients. You can also try to do quantum gravity or at least perturbative quantum gravity in ADS where maybe you get some, some diagrams like an exchange of a graviton between two particles. And then in ADS, so generally if we draw Feynman diagrams in ADS, we draw them, that's like a standard Feynman diagram with a circle around it. That's the language that we use. We mean that this is in ADS. And so this thing would be a small correction to the four point function where now I put all the four points already at the boundary of ADS. And so it would be a small correction to this generalized free solutions. So we are interested in corrections to GFF and if we want to understand interactions in ADS, we want to, we want to understand how we can sort of deform this generalized free solution. <coughs> okay, yes? Um, that is the hope, yeah. Like the ADS CFT correspondence um, says that a theory of quantum gravity in ADS is fully described by its boundary correlation functions. In general, if I take a quantum field theory in ADS, I mean, that's because quantum gravity doesn't really have local observables. I don't think if you take a quantum field theory in ADS, I can define an observable at a finite distance away from, from, uh, from the boundary, finite, finite z, which is always an infinite distance, then I think it's not quite possible to, to reconstruct the bulk from the boundary. So in quantum gravity, you cannot really do that. So you have a constraint because you have different variants and you cannot really go into the bulk. Or at least I mean, people try perturbatively, but non-perturbatively you cannot. But um, uh, for quantum, just a quantum field theory, I think it's, it's not quite possible. You need to know the coefficients with which a bulk operator becomes a boundary operator. And there's a list of coefficients that you need to know before you can uplift stuff to the bulk. Um, of course, quantum gravity, people like to say that if you have a consistent CFT, it defines a theory of quantum gravity. We'll just say this is the definition of a theory of quantum gravity is whatever obeys the CFT axioms and then we're good. So, so one, one big topic is um, to study these corrections to generalized free field theory. And the idea is to use dispersive techniques. And I'm out of time, so it's really going to be uh, an, an overview, but um, let's recall this, um, this crossing equation. And I'll start from the from the numerical game again. So um, like I said, you can analyze this and in three dimensions you find, for example, the easing kink. And so you have presumably an actual solution to crossing symmetry sitting very close. We don't, we cannot solve it exactly, but it sits very close to this, to this point. So numerically the functional that we find and now with the correct signs, because we have to get to zero and I'm gonna act with a functional on everything, so for spin zero as a function of delta, I'm going to get a contradiction. So I'm going to get a positive thing on the identity, then it may become negative, and then it should remain positive afterwards. <clears throat> and for higher spins, if I just plot delta minus L, that starts at D minus two, 
I should also get something positive. And this would give me a contradiction if all the operators would, would sit in the positive region of the functional. So there's the identity sitting here, and all the other stuff should sit, say, here, here, and maybe one here, one here, one here. Right? This is an inconsistent spectrum. What must happen is that there's some operator where in the region where the functional is negative, but since it's so close to the boundary, it's probably right here. Right? And so um, going back to the numerics, this is actually what, what people see for, for the 3D easing. If you just plot the functional action, so alpha on F for say L, L, L equals two, you see that it's, it's, um, it has this dip, it's almost zero on the identity, and then um, it's positive everywhere else. So this zero is very close to, to delta epsilon. But you see, we have to get to zero on the left-hand side. The functional here gives a contribution of small, very small positive. Here is very small, negative, but the sum of these is still very small. So the contribution of this guy better also be very small because otherwise we already have a contradiction. So what I explained quickly, I think in a previous lecture, is that the functional is basically doing, doing something like this. It's just going to be zero on all the operators in the theory. And going back to the numerics, this is how people estimate scaling dimensions in, um, uh, in, in the, of, of subleading operators in the easing model. So this would be, for example, the identity operator, which is easy. This is the epsilon operator, which we already discussed. But this would be another operator that's typically denoted epsilon prime, a scalar. Its dimension is approximately four point something. And one good way to estimate it is to just do the numerics and see where the functional has the next double zero, an epsilon double prime and so on. Here at spin two, this would be the stress tensor. This would be an operator. Well, if we just continue the nomenclature, it would be T prime, T double prime and so on. You can do the same for higher spins. Uh, I have a board. Do the same for higher spins. So L equals four, L equals six, and so on. You get some functional. But of course, now we're getting into large spin territory. And at large spin, we know what happens. So we have two delta phi, two delta sigma, which is approximately 1.036. We have two delta sigma plus two. We have two delta sigma plus four. Uh, and this is true if we plot delta minus L. So, the so this, is, this is approximately where the operators must be. So the functional, if we plot it, um, will have approximate double zeros there. They may be off by a little bit. So I'm not drawing this exactly, but, but roughly speaking, this is what happens for the low spins. And then at the unitarity bound, it may have a simple zero, which is a D minus two. Turns out that these two are very close to each other. This is just a coincidence of easing. This is one, the unitarity bound, and the, this dimension is a little bit above it. But okay, so be it. <clears throat> so this is what the functional indeed looks like numerically for very large spin. So now you can ask, well, is there an analytical game? Can I be, try to be smart and guess what the functional looks like? So clearly, for three-dimensional easing, guessing what the exact functional, the optimal functional would look like would, would be the same as knowing all the scaling dimensions in the theory, which seems impossible. These are not nice numbers. But there, we know all the scaling dimensions in the theory. Right? We have a solution, and we know all the scaling dimensions it's been, and it's all nice integers. So are there functionals that play a role, that do something like this, but then for the generalized free theory? Can you, can you write down these type of functionals? So, of course, you can try to do things numerically, but numerically, you only get some approximations. Um, so you have to be smarter than that. And we have a few people, only like very few, definitely not me, but we have a few people who are indeed smarter than that. And so now we have two ways of finding functionals. One is like we ask the computer, and the other is we ask these people. And uh, they, they're very good, and they indeed found a functional that has precisely 
the kind of structure that you would expect. It has double zeros on all the um, on all the on all these operators. The functional is a thing that acts on any four-point function, right? Yeah. So the functional is now sort of, it, there's a kind of duality between solutions and functionals. But given the solution, I can ask, what is the functional that has double zeros or single, single zeros maybe at the first one, but then double zeros afterwards? What's that functional? Well, smart people found that. Now, we perturb the solution a little bit, but the crossing equation should still be obeyed. So the functional on the perturbed solution should still be zero. And that is the game you can play, right? The game to play is interactions in ADS are corrections to GFF. We have a functional that sort of kills everything, that zero on all the conformal blocks that appear here. So nothing contributes on the, on the left of the crossing equations. It's zero on all of these, on these F functions. Right, for, for generalized free field theory, it's zero automatically, it's exactly obeyed, and now we start doing perturbations of generalized free field theories, and so we can, we can say something about perturbations of, GF, of, of this free theory. And therefore, we can say something about interactions in ADS. We can say something about corrections to a free theory in ADS. We can say something about um, corrections to Einstein-Hilbert gravity, for example. If you start with, with um, free gravitons um, <clears throat> in ADS, um, that would just be sort of the leading term in the, if you view the, the, the classical gravity as some kind of classical field theory, um, <clears throat> you start with free gravitons, then you perturbatively build up your interactions, you can say something about, about the strength of these interactions. And you can say something about quantum field theory in, in ADS in general. Um, so this, this is the So this, the, the technique of dispersive functionals, which I did not want to explain in, in, in detail, it's like, fun so dispersive functionals. Are by definition functionals that vanish on um, the GFF spectrum. More precisely, the spectrum of this spectrum of operators. And so for every delta hat, you can try to define a dispersive functional, but generally people have found it as a function of delta hat. No, but it has to be a gadget that acts on this and then gives zero. You cannot write a function, you have to write alpha, so let me say a kernel because a good way to define a functional is via kernel. L delta. So you have to give me a function of two variables, d, dz, dz bar. We, we, before we set a finite combination of derivatives. So then this would be derivatives of delta functions. But um, more generally, this is a function or a distribution of two variables that when it acts on these kind of functions, which were hugely complicated, then you get zero precisely for the GFF spectrum. But it depends on delta. It depends on delta, yeah, and L. But in a very complicated way, because these are like hypergeometric functions of delta. Also, in a way, are you unique? Yeah, yeah, there's a question of uniqueness, which indeed. So for example, the the, there's a numerical game for which people, that you can do numerically, but the smart people can also find functionals for, and then you see that the numerical functional does not seem to converge to what the smart people found, so probably there's some degeneracy. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the yeah. No, you're, you're saying that there are no, there's no stress tensor in the conformal block decomposition of generalized free field theory. There is not, right? That is the non-locality of the aspect of it. But everything else works. So there, there's no stress tensor, but it's like the long range models, sometimes conformal invariance 
emerges in a way that is not directly, cannot be argued from starting from the existence of a stress tensor, but the theory is nevertheless conformal. Here also, there's no stress tensor in this boundary spectrum, but um, because of my ADS construction, I still claim there's conformal invariance. So this is a big, big subject now, and um, I just wanted to, let me just list some, some possible applications. These functional, these kernels are not particularly insightful. This is, there's some way to argue how, how the, there, there's some physics there. Uh, the to, I mean, these people are physicists and, and they have some physical intuition as to how, how to construct these functions. Um, but uh, then in the end result, you get some very complicated kernels and uh, I, I, I didn't want to write them down. There are some integrals also over some complex Z and Z bar coordinates. You take Z and Z bar independent and complex, and that's what you have to do to, to get these type of functionals. Yeah? The dispersive functionals, no, but the applications are most interesting when you have something that is GFF. Oh yeah, sorry, ADS CFT or QFT in ADS? Yeah. ADS -CFT. Uh, yeah, let me list the applications and then uh, um, ADS CFT or not depends on whether you have a stress tensor or not, right? If I do quantum gravity, I have a graviton and I can take the two point function of a graviton or a vector field, a massless vector field in, a massless spin two field in ADS. I bring that two point function to the boundary and I see that what I get is precisely a spin two operator of dimension D that is conserved, so a stress tensor. So gravity in ADS gives me a stress tensor on the boundary. If I just do lambda 514 ADS, I don't have a graviton, I don't get the stress tensor on the boundary. So that's the only difference between quantum gravity and not. From the, from, the, from the perspective of the boundary conformal correlators, the only difference is whether you're doing quantum gravity or not is whether there's a stress tensor or not. So the various applications of this, um, So um, constraints on, on low energy effective theories. So um, is what I want to say on effective field theories. So effective field theories are like theories that are free at long distances, but then they have small corrections that, that scale, like um, that scale with some power of the coupling. So for example, I can take a free scalar at long distances and then um, I have some interaction and sometimes this scalar is a Goldstone boson so there's a shift symmetry and then the leading interaction um, must come with derivatives. So it's d phi to the four and then you get something like uh, lambda to the d with lambda some power. And then it turns out uh, it's a well-known result that this coupling g in some conventions that I'm not going to specify so there's a plus or minus here but your convention, if you're careful about your conventions, then this G is, is positive. It turns out that uh, this is some kind of universal constraint for effective field theory that people in the old days got from, from the scattering of this, of this field. So this is a, um, you can take this field, it's approximately free, free at low energies. So you understand what the scattering does at low energies and then you do some dispersion relation trick, relate high energies to low energies and you can show that this, this coupling must be positive. So this is an old result from 2006, but now you can derive the same kind of results from this, from this CFT arguments. Um, you can do the same for another theory, you look at Einstein gravity. So if your action is the Einstein-Hilbert action, and then you add a correction like this, then it turns out that you can get correct, you can with some coefficient alpha, 
then from this game you can get rigorous constraints on, on this alpha. There, there are actual numbers there for the dimensions uh, copy. Now these, these numbers turn out to be, um, this, this, uh, this cutoff should be some scale of, of, of new physics and these numbers turn out to be experimentally not nearly close to being uh, uh, observable. But it's still nice that, that we can get these type of constraints. There are various assumptions going in here. For example, this skill needs to be much smaller than the, the Planck skill, but that's not what I, what I want to get into. But there are these type of, of games that you can play. And uh, lastly, um, finally, so you can get some constraints on S matrices on, on flat space. matrices. So here um, what you want to do is to um, to make the following picture. So you suppose that your theory in ADS is Something like this, it's the, it's the free solution plus permutations. And then there's an interaction. So one, two, three, four. And then I send all the points to the boundary. So this is my ADS theory, then it is natural. <coughs> so this is phi, 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 phi. Then the limit of this thing that I constructed in ADS, what would it be as, so what would it, so this thing now lives on the boundary, so it's, it's a function of x1. 2 phi of x4. And you can ask, well, let me now take this thing. It still depends on the ADS radius. You can see it here. Delta hat is um, a function of m squared r squared. So it depends on the ADS radius, on the ADS curvature. It changes a little bit with the curvature. And this thing will probably be some very complicated function of the curvature. So what happens if I now make ADS flat, I take this four point function and I send the radius of curvature to infinity. The Ricci scalar was one over R squared, so the Ricci scalar goes to zero. Well, you see that if I hold all the masses fixed, then this is like the large delta limit. So I'm now interested in the large, if the mass is non-zero, in the large delta hat limit of these correlation functions. <clears throat> well, the claim is of course that this if you think of these as Feynman diagrams, then I would get some disconnected pieces and uh, some connected pieces. But these are flat space diagrams. In particular, it's natural to expect, and this is also what happens, that this four point function becomes, this connected four point function, becomes the flat space scattering amplitude. So up to a whole bunch of subtleties that I'm swiping under the rug, it is um, kind of true that a four point function that is conformally invariant, that depends on this MR in the large delta limit, so the limit where all the scaling dimensions becomes large, becomes some kind of scattering amplitude. And so this is a nice little game that, that we've been playing only, only very recently, which is try to say something about scattering amplitudes from the conformal bootstrap. You can try to do that with these dispersive functionals. You can also try to do numerics here and try to see if you can say some constraint scattering amplitudes in this way. And so um, one particularly nice, cute result that I like, um, because it's my own, is that uh, 
these scattering amplitudes are pretty poorly understood. If you understand, like their dispersion relations, they, they have a domain of analyticity. It's complicated stuff that has, that's, you basically start from the Weidman axioms, the LZ prescription, and then you work very hard to show that these have some domain of analyticity. One second. Um, whereas these have a nice convergent conformal block decomposition, and so they're analytic in a huge domain. <laughs> So can you show that these have a nice domain of analyticity um, if I start from, the, see, view them as limits of analytic functions? So that's something that's, that we're in the process of figuring out, but we have some encouraging initial results. So what you mean is double at the right hand. Does it mean that we are taking the projection first on the CFT and then on R? Yeah, yeah, this is the, this is, this double bracket is always the limit as is that i goes to zero of something in ADS. So it's just a z to zero limit. Because I, I, I want to introduce a notation for something that's conformally invariant, but not a CFT correlation function. So I use the double bracket. That is a, a conformally covariant correlation function. And, and like I said, so think of this as a conformally covariant object, a bit like, like this, this GFF, but then a bit more complicated. And now I send, make all the scaling dimensions large. What happens? My claim is that in this limit, very often you'll find something like this and then a scattering amplitude in some particular way. And so now I'm going to say, well, this thing was analytic, is the limit of a sequence of, of uh, you have a series of analytic functions, one for each R, a sequence. Is the limit of a sequence of analytic functions still analytic? That's, a, that's an important question. It's not automatic, but you can still say something. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so there should have been a cosmological constant. But um, yeah, you, uh, you, but you can make it as small as you want there also. So in that case, the stress tensor corresponds to a massless field. So delta, do not, delta does not become large, it just remains deep. It's always the stress tensor. If you have gravity in the bulk, then you have a stress tensor on the boundary. And I think then it's, it corresponds to a proper CFT. If you take type 2B string theory on ADS5 times an extra S5 that I did not write about, then you get N equals 4 super young nils on the boundary. They're well-known examples of theory in the bulk and like proper conformal field theory on the boundary and string theory in the bulk. Yeah. That's ADS CFT. Okay. So um, I guess I should stop here. What did I had some final Slides prepared or final final page prepared, but um, let's let's summarize. Yeah. I think it would be cool to study the large delta limit in full generality, but in the result that I have is I need to make some assumption that this. That, that the implicitly assumes there's a good ADS theory that generates these correlation functions. But it would be really cool if you can always find, say that the large delta limit would always give me something nice in terms of amplitude. So um, just one recap then, um, what did we do? Well, I started with YCFTs. Um, we discussed, so in particular this RG business then we discussed the CFT axioms. Then we discussed the numerical bootstrap. Then I introduced this um, dispersive functionals. But let me rephrase that as saying that there's some analytical bootstrap. This business of dispersive functionals can also be used to say something about easing and the O2 model. It's not a completely disconnected, sorry, easing O2, any, any standard conformal field theory. For example, you can use it to improve the large spin. You see these functionals that I did not even write. 
but they, they kind of match what you expect at large spin anyway in, in any conformal field theory, because any conformal field theory at large spin looks a bit like this generalized free theory. So these functionals can be used to understand better the large spin expansion also. And finally, there are these uh, connections to ADS and uh, scattering amplitudes that I only touched upon for an infinitesimal amount of time. But I hope you've now some association of what the physics is and what the mathematics is uh, for all of these parts. So let me stop here. Thank you.